Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's such a blessing uh, to be here and just to talk through another one of these parables. And I really enjoyed this series we've gone through in parables. And what I've enjoyed so much about it is something that I was thinking about is each of these parables was made and crafted by Jesus himself. And there's such an intentionality in that. Um, and when we think about it, it's really God making a story for us to help us better understand him. And so many of these parables, you could almost say are ridiculous, the story. It's something that would never happen um, as far as like in real life with humans. Um, but they're really the only thing that do any type of justice or any story that does any type of justice to the love that Jesus has for us and the love that God has for us. And the parable that I wanted to talk about today uh, is a parable a lot of you are probably familiar with, and it's called the parable of the prodigal son. But I really like to call it the parable of the compassionate father. And Jesus actually never himself calls it the parable of the prodigal son. That's a term that we've assigned to it and a title that we've assigned to it. And before getting into that parable, I wanted to actually go back uh, to a parable that Jeff shared about a month ago, which is the parable of the great banquet. And uh, this parable is found in Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 23. And it's found in Luke uh, just before the parable of the prodigal son. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just a brief summary is in this parable, there's a man who's having a banquet and he starts by inviting who seem to be maybe the people who are more notable in society. And um, each of these people who he invites to the party has some type of an excuse not to come. Uh, one of them says he's bought some oxen, one of them says he's just married his wife, and one of them says that he has some land, but the bottom line is they make an excuse not to come. And Jeff used a word for them that really seemed to make sense to me, is there's almost a dismissiveness there. And so these people decide not to come. He tells his servants to go out and to invite the poor and the blind and the crippled and the lame to this banquet. And the parable says that the poor and the blind and the crippled and lame show up to the banquet and there's still extra seats. So he goes out and tells his servants to invite people from the highways and the hedges. And we could almost look at this as he's inviting the people um, on the outskirts of society to this banquet. And something that really stood out to me about this parable when Jeff was teaching it is both the people who show up to the banquet and the people who make an excuse have the same invitation. And this banquet is talking about the kingdom of God. And I don't just mean in an eternal sense. It is that. But I also mean right here and right now. And so the only thing preventing these people from being in this place of celebration and joy at this banquet and being in relation to Jesus is themselves. No one kicks them out of the banquet. No one uses any justifiers to say that they can't be there. Jesus invites us all there, but it leaves us with two questions. And I think this parable of the prodigal son will help us answer these questions. And the first question is, what do we do? Or how do we make sure we accept the invitation to this banquet? And the answer might seem obvious. Of course, you have to say yes. But when we look deeper, you could also think, like, what are the things that keep us from celebrating in the kingdom of God? And I, I mean right here today. What are the things that keep us from uh, being part of this beautiful celebration that Jesus has for us? So what do we do to accept this invitation into the banquet? And the second question I have is, what is this banquet like? What is the kingdom of God like? Not only eternally, but here today. And so with that, I want us to keep those questions in mind. And I'm going to read... Um, the parable of the prodigal son. And it's found in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And it will be up on the screen. And if you'd like to follow along in your Bible, I'd encourage you to do that as well. And he said, there's a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. 
But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you but when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother is dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The word of the Lord. Well, I want to get back just real quick to our two questions, and it's how do we accept the invitation to this banquet, and what is the banquet like? And clearly in these two parables, both of them have a party in the parable. So the first one, this man's inviting these people to the banquet, and in this parable, we look at this father having a celebration for his son. And some people come into the celebration, and some don't. So how do we be a part of this banquet? How do we be a part of God's kingdom here on earth? All of us here in Laguna Beach as a family, how do we take action to celebrate in that? And, and what does it look like? What does being part of God's kingdom look like? So I think in this parable, there's so many different angles uh, that we could look at that Jesus is communicating us, to us through. And we could look at our place and which of the sons we identify with. And I could probably think of five or six other different angles we could look at. But the angle that I want to look at is the angle of the father and how the father acts. And again, I'd really call this parable the compassionate father rather than the prodigal son. But in order to look at the father, in order to get like, a full view of the father and what he's doing and the gravity of this situation, I think it's really helpful to look at each of the sons and look at each of their hearts. And I think a lot of their hearts relates to us. And so it starts out with his younger son. And at the very beginning of the parable, he asks his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And what he's really asking him for is his share of the inheritance. And so he basically starts this story by giving his father a slap in the face. And I don't know about you, but if I thought of any parent I know and their child asked them to give them their share of the inheritance before they'd passed away, I don't think that would go well with anyone. <laughs> and even more so in this culture, we got to remember that when the Bible was written, when Luke was written, this was a time where the Jewish people, they were like a Near Eastern uh, honor culture. And you don't say these type of things to a father then. And fathers are held with this place of great honor. And right off the bat, this father would be in a place where a lot of people wouldn't be surprised if he immediately attacked them or executed his judgment on the son for asking this question that was so offensive, but he doesn't do that. And instead, the father gives him this share of the property, and the son goes off and squanders this property. And it doesn't get into all of the specifics, but it's obvious that he gets to this place where he's in a place of physical poverty and he's physically hungry and he's living and sleeping with the pigs. And when I first read this parable and started studying, I thought, wow, great, I'm not the prodigal son because I've never been in a place where I'm physically poor and have nothing to eat. But I think so much more of this parable is metaphorical. And I think all of us have elements of being this prodigal son. And 
I love how in verse 16 it paints this picture, and it says, no one gave him anything. And I think of how many times in my life or in all of our lives we get to a place where we're just pursuing after things that aren't truly going to fulfill us. And it could be such a wide range of things we pursue, but I look at my own life and just think of tendencies to just spend time um, pursuing after things, whether it's social media or maybe something I'm trying to buy or whatever it is, and just end up feeling in this exact same place of the prodigal son, of no one gave him anything. And maybe these things have some type of value, but at the end of the day, I just find myself feeling hungry, just like this prodigal son. And so what this son does is, when he realizes that he's hungry and that no one's giving him anything, it actually seems pretty logical when we think of all the humans in this world. And he thinks he's going to go to his father and, says, and say to his father that he's sinned against the father and admit his fault. And I like how in verse 20 it says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son and treat me as one of your hired servants. So clearly he doesn't think that the father is going to offer this full level of forgiveness. And maybe he's going to somewhat work his way back into his father's house in this lowly position of just being a servant. And this is where Jesus really just turns this entire story on its head when it says, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And so we see this image of the son trying to make things right with his father and be in this place of the celebration and the party that doesn't work. He's trying to make things right himself, but this father embraces him while he's still a long way off. I love that he used the term, he was still a long way off. It doesn't say that after the son proved himself and did the right thing for a while and showed that he was actually faithful to the father. It says that the father runs and embraces him while he's still a long way off. And we've got to remember again that this is a totally different culture at the time. And fathers then don't run. It was part of the Jewish culture that a father is basically not going to work and not going to run. And he's almost like this king of this little kingdom, uh, these fathers, and, and, and how they're treated in, the, in this social system they have. But instead, I get this image of the father running through the dirt and the mud to immediately embrace his son. And we've got to remember, the son's been living with a pig, so he probably smells bad and is dirty, and it's probably a mess. But in all that, the father runs to him and embraces him. And the son still tries to say his, his line of, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father immediately responds by telling the servants to put on the best put quickly the best robe on him and put shoes on his feet and a ring on his hand. I love even the detail of the ring on his hand. Of um, The ring has no value as far as actually clothing someone or providing them their feet protection from the ground. He's putting his son in this place of love and place of honor uh, when the son's done nothing to earn that. And so we see from this first son what doesn't work, which is trying to enter this place of celebration and community with God and God's kingdom by pursuing after these things that we may think make us happy, and then by trying to earn our way back into a right place with God. But what we do see is we start to see what the father's like, and we see this father just give the son this absolute unconditional and unwavering love and embrace, and he doesn't even have time to see where the son's at yet or see what's going on with the son or give the chance to, pr to prove himself. He, he immediately just embraces the son. So I want to briefly look at the older son now, and this older son seems to me like someone who would probably be respected by most people as people think he's the guy who's doing the right thing. And it says that he obeyed his father's commands. But when we look at the heart of both the younger son and the older son, there's really not that big of a difference. Or maybe there's even no difference. And it says that, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. You never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. That's that's the voice of the older son. and it, This older son doesn't say that anything about his father. He doesn't say that he wants to celebrate with his father. He's upset because he doesn't have a goat so he could celebrate with his friends. And so we get this image of both the older son and the younger son who maybe want the blessings of the father. The younger son wants the inheritance, and the older son wants maybe these blessings that the father could give him by sticking with the father, but neither of them actually want the father, and neither, neither of them actually want the heart of the father. And by the way, this older son in that culture would have been called upon to help bring his younger son home, which is obviously part of the father's heart, which we see by the embrace of the younger son. And the, younger, the older son doesn't do this. The older son 
we don't see any place where he goes to find his younger brother. So we see this image of, of two sons who don't actually want to be with their father. And I think of how many times all of us have this same type of heart of maybe wanting the blessings that Jesus gives us and the blessing that God has us, but not actually wanting to be with God. And we get in this place of we don't see anything that God's doing or that Jesus is doing to create distance between us and him. And in fact, all we see is an embrace from Jesus. But we're the ones that create that distance. When the father goes to welcome this older son into the celebration that he's having uh, for his younger son, he talks about that he hasn't gotten a young goat to celebrate, but he also talks about uh, his brother and begins comparing himself to this younger brother. And when we really look at it, a lot of what's keeping this older son away from this celebration and this party and this awesome time with his father is just this comparison uh, with his younger brother. And I love that the father replies by saying, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. And I just think what a compassionate and what a loving response to someone who's really hurting the father. If you think about it, the father is in this place of celebration and joy that his younger son has returned. And the father has just humbled himself in this extreme way to embrace and to love his younger son. But all he gets from this older son is this complaint and this comparison. And I think what an insult to the father. I love that it is left open too. We don't see what the older son does. We see that the son is, older son is left with this opportunity to still draw near to the celebration and draw near to the father. And so I know I got a little off track there, but with our questions, I want to get back to those. So how do we enter the kingdom of God, and how do we celebrate that? And I mean here today, and what does this look like? And we just looked at both sons, and clearly what they're doing doesn't work. And at different points in the story, they keep themselves from being in this place of celebration with their father. And it's the same thing in the previous parable of this man who's throwing the banquet does nothing to keep anyone out of the banquet, but people basically decide to keep themselves out of this banquet. And I think to understand or even begin to understand at all of how do we accept this invitation that Jesus has given us and how do we accept this place in the kingdom of God, we have to look at the Father. Because clearly anything that the people do or the, the sons do are not enough on their own to get into the kingdom. And they're, they're, again, keeping themselves from being part of this banquet. And when we look at the Father, we see just someone who has an unconditional love and an unconditional embrace. And again, this parable is meant to sound extreme. This isn't a culture where the father almost certainly would have never spent time with this younger son again and completely disowned him and would have every right to completely rebuke his older son. Yet we see this image of this father with just unconditional embrace. And it really makes me think that the way that we enter into God's kingdom and take part in this beautiful celebration that he has by us, or has for us, is we simply just open our hearts, and we open our hearts to the unconditional love and the unconditional embrace that the Father has. And when we do that, when we open our hearts to the love and embrace that Jesus has for us, we do something special, and we give Jesus this place in our lives to break the chains, and by chains, I mean the chains of comparison that the older son had, and the chains of feeling a need to find content in things that aren't really going to make us content in the long run. And the chains of feeling like we need to earn our way back into a place with Jesus. And what we do is we find our place in a self of freedom when we open our hearts to this unconditional love and this unconditional embrace that Jesus and his Father have for us. And I think Jesus goes even deeper here than just to look at the Father. When we look at the rest of Scripture, when we look at the rest of the New Testament, Jesus doesn't just say to look to him, but he says to follow his example. I'd like to read just a short passage from John chapter 13, uh, verses 13 through 15. It'll be up on the screen as well. And it says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. And so when we look at the Father in this parable, 
we could say it's both God the Father and we could say it's Jesus. And Jesus is clearly telling us in John to follow his example. And when we follow this example, it also sets us free of something and it allows us this freedom to look at people the way the Father looks at people. And regardless of what people have done or where they stand or their status or maybe they've done some great things or bad things, it doesn't matter at all. The Father looks at them with this heart of love and tenderness and embrace. And as we open our hearts to that love and tenderness and embrace that Jesus has for us, and we begin to experience this freedom of being able to love and embrace others and have absolutely no boundary in that. There's no restraint in the love that we can have for others when we're in Jesus. We start to answer our second question and we see what this banquet is like. And I think so much of the kingdom of God and so much of the banquet is simply just marked by us experiencing Jesus' love and in turn being able to extend that love to each other and to each person we come into contact with without any type of restraint or having to think if it's okay to love people or justify ourselves loving people. We have full freedom to love and embrace each and every person we come into contact with. And I really think that there's such a beauty in that. I think that when you look at someone like this who is known for loving others and caring for others and just has this kindness to everyone they come into contact with, I don't know about you, but I think, wow, how beautiful. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing for us. He's embracing us and embracing our heart and giving us this chance to do that to others. And it allows us to see such beauty in other people, which is a blessing to us, but it also does something beautiful in ourselves. So Jesus is doing this beautiful work in us by changing us and changing the way we look at people and changing the way we care for other people. And I know I said that I want to relate this to right here and right now today. I think so much we think about the kingdom of God as only eternal, which it absolutely is. And I believe that we're able to have this love and embrace for others and feel that love and embrace of Jesus in all of eternity. But I think right here in Laguna Beach as a church family, when we go to work and whatever we do, we absolutely have this opportunity. So I thought of a few examples um, to maybe make this a little more real or just bring it down to earth for us. And something that has been really, uh, has really stood out to me about getting to be on staff here that I just didn't expect was I feel like I get to see the kingdom of God in a way that I didn't before. And all that I mean by that, it's pretty simple actually, is it's not anything I've done or any special thing or any special thing about a position. It's simply that I've just got to spend a lot of time with people here from church. Um, and because I'm not doing another job, I get to be around all of you a lot more. And it's been such a blessing to see this and so many of you, the love and embrace for each other. And it makes me feel like I'm at this party and I'm at the celebration. I'm at the kingdom of God. Uh, and I want to put up a picture um, from youth camp. Uh, this was winter camp over um, the last winter. So we took a group of, I think it was six high schoolers. So we had a pretty small group and we had all junior, uh, or we had all juniors and seniors in high school. And we were out uh, playing different recreation games and uh, myself and Liz and Travis, two of the other leaders, got to be there with the kids and we're having such an awesome time. And our group has all these juniors and seniors and there's everyone from junior high to high school at this event. And our group kind of drew a lot of attention because a lot of our kids were doing great in the different uh, events and activities, being some of the older kids. And there's this kid who, I think he was in sixth or seventh grade, his name was Salem, and he's the one, the third one from the right. And I just remember him kind of walking around and not really having a group of friends, or um, seemed like he was a little lonely. And I saw the juniors and seniors at our church just immediately come up to him and embrace him. And he just walked up and said hi. I don't think he necessarily did anything super special, but he walked up and said hi. And there was just this immediate embrace for him, and there wasn't anything at all of them thinking, hey, this kid's younger than us, or we don't know him. And we hung out with him for a while, and it was, I just thought such a beautiful thing just to see like this love and embrace without any type of restraint. And when I see that picture, every time I look at it, I think, wow, that's the kingdom of God right there. And I, I see it so much in our church. Um, there's so many people here. When I think of Bob and Sheila and the time I get to spend with you guys, and just your love and embrace for each person, and um, in morning prayer and just every time I see you guys. And I think of Sherry and True and um, 
they're just open kindness and embrace to each person who's here. And when I think of Marcia and her just love to pray for, uh, for each person that she comes into contact with, I think that's the kingdom of God. And I think we have, I could go on for hours with examples of this, but the reason I share these things is I wanted this to be real for us because I feel like and I know that the kingdom of God is here today. And we not only have this opportunity to love and embrace each other, but we have now the freedom and I think the power through Christ to love and embrace people who are difficult to embrace. When we see the father, he goes and embraces the son who probably wasn't very fun to embrace after sleeping in the dirt and sleeping with pigs and the situation he was in. So I think of this beautiful work that Christ does in, our, in us when we open our hearts to him, he gives us this opportunity to open our hearts to others and embrace literally anyone we come into contact with in that same way. Well, my final encouragement is, you know, when I think about this parable, I think there's so many different things in our world that are begging for our attention and asking for our attention. And even within the Bible, there's many different things that Jesus speaks to us. And I, I think each part of the Bible is beautiful. But I think about this parable, and I think about what a way to spend our time and to spend our energy that's actually really worth it and just really tangibly worth it. Of We can literally see the kingdom of God right here when we love and embrace others. And so I'd just like to pray for us. And I'd like to invite you guys to pray with me as I just uh, thank Jesus and we thank Jesus together for his heart for us. Jesus, we love you and we just thank you for the heart you have for us and just literally every person you've created that you just have this heart of unconditional pursuit and love and embrace that we don't find anywhere else. And we just pray that this heart could be just so well known in our family here in our church. And I just pray that we have eyes that see these opportunities to love and embrace others. And I pray that each of us here would just feel such a freedom to do so and just be able to take part in your celebration and your banquet in doing so. And it's your, in your name we pray, amen. Well, in a few moments, Jeff's going to come up and lead us in communion. And I just want to invite you guys. I think this is such a great opportunity to think about and just uh, meditate on a little bit the love that Jesus has for each one of us. Thank you, guys.